Um, so yeah, just again, I'm so grateful to Denise for putting this together. It's such an exciting interdisciplinary affair, um, and it's wonderful to be in such great company. So again, thank you. And I want to apologize because this talk um, is going to be slightly bifurcated. Um, I'm going to begin by outlining the research context into which I became engaged with viral hemorrhagic fevers and latterly the Ebola outbreak. So uh, some of that is going to focus actually on Lassa fever, which we're going to talk about. And I'm drawing here from work, some collaborative work with colleagues um, at Charité Berlin and at Durham University and with the Food and, the food and um, Agriculture Organization. So the hope here was with this kind of interdisciplinary group um, is to develop some dynamics into primary transmission, right, a kind of viral spillover from animals to humans, which Kevin began to talk about uh, such a presentation before the break. Then I'm going to end by briefly just summarizing and touching upon some of the work in the UK to collectivize anthropological engagements with the outbreak, the Cibola response platform, and some of the challenges and key questions that anthropologists have been raising um, and the way they've been involved, at least in the UK, with um, efforts to contain and respond to the outbreak. So two different kind of points. Um, so for the past couple of years, um, I've been involved in an interdisciplinary project studying the incidence of Lassa fever um, in Sierra Leone and Guinea um, and the effectiveness of rodent control in limiting the spread of the virus from rats, which is the primary reservoir for Lassa to humans. Um, Lassa fever is a viral hemorrhagic fever that's related to Ebola um, and to Marburg, but it's transmitted through, it's also transmitted through human to human contact, but the primary reservoir is the multi-mammate rat. Um, and it shares a number of virological and clinical features with Ebola. However, and this is critical, I think, from the point of view of the kind of politics of response, is it does, it does not kill as many of those who become infected. Um, and indeed, a high proportion of these cases are asymptomatic, um, which actually um, seems like might be the case with Ebola, too. There's a lot of question marks about what's happening there. So, where it is endemic, and again, we're talking about the Mana River region, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, um, it kills over kind of the population many more than Ebola. Um, although, again, we'll see what happens with this outbreak. And estimates range from about five to 10,000 fatalities per year. Um, recent studies have shown that the end endemicity of the area, that it's growing, that more cases are being found wherever there's kind of tropical wooded savanna. So, again, um, where the kind of directions of what's happening with Lassa um, remain to be seen. There is a treatment for Lassa fever, um, but its success usually hinges upon early detection, which can be complicated for all of the reasons that we've been talking about with Ebola in terms of healthcare infrastructure systems, finding case detection, the fact that these viral hemorrhagic fevers have symptoms that might look like malaria or any other hosts of diseases. So I think there are a number of interesting questions about the relative urgency um, of Lassa fever vis-a-vis -vis Ebola, um, and the kind of, and one of the interesting points is of course the difference in fatality rate, but also the number of unknowns and how Ebola does tend to fit into this kind of narrative of um, you know outbreak, contagion, um, the hot zone that Lassa sits a bit more awkwardly with. And I think I'm going to come back to it at the end. Um, the talk just about what are kind of the politics of response and the difference between attending to kind of a punctuated outbreak as opposed to these endemic problems. So the anthropological aspects of LAROX um, sought to elaborate the intimate settings of transmission. And this really focuses on this question of how um, rats and humans live together, right? And we're talking about in the bush, in the village, kind of between and within houses in an effort to come to grips with kind of the everyday spaces and paces of viral contact and transmission. Um, we're also interested um, in exploring the practices of consumption, um, trying to add ethnographic depth, depth to who is catching rats, how and the ways in which animals are prepared and handled, when and why. Um, and really interested in overall importance of bush meat consumption as it intersects with food security um, and other questions of kind of everyday life because so you see, there's a lot of um, politics around, you know, bushmeat bans or why you know it's important to get people to stop eating bushmeat. But our hope here was to get a kind of finer grade sense of, you know, when are people eating, why are people eating, and you know, how might you think about behavior change in that context. So just to give you some sense um, of the ethnographic 
line of inquiry. Um, our, gain, our aim, again, is to think through the problems and possibilities of disease control by giving kind of this granularity <coughs> to the human-animal um, encounter. Who is coming into contact with rats, um, when and why, and symmetrically, you know, how rats are coming into contact with humans. Um, and the point here is to understand kind of the mutual dynamics of this um, interactional space to see, you know, who, who is avoiding whom and when are actually these kind of <coughs> transmission happening. So to the end, we were looking in communities in Ferrana and Guacaru um, Prefecture, which is where they also became the, ep the epicenter for the outbreak began by looking at some of the distribution of domestic space, um, what's called a concession, how houses are organized um, around a courtyard, the placement of um, you know, latrines, grain stores, kitchens and showers. And you know, we're interested in everything, in um, sleeping arrangements, the gender distribution of domestic labor, who is preparing the meals and why. Um, for instance, during the dry season, it's, there's a ban on cooking in the middle of the day because there might be a fire, and that might have implications for where people are cooking and where they're storing their food <coughs> in particular seasons and when rats come in to find it. So we're also looking at the um, construction and aesthetics of homes, particularly interested in practices of care and maintenance. Right? Um, and we're finding that the decision to move from a mud um, construction or mud bricks to a concrete one was usually a sign of social mobility, but that also, because concrete's supposed to last longer, people took, you know, wouldn't do more in terms of kind of maintaining the house. If they found a burrow, they wouldn't kind of re-cement it because of the cost. So again, looking at what were these practices of, of domestic care um, and maintenance and how might that um, either amplify or help control um, points of contact between rats and humans. We also paid close attention to the location of objects um, and furnishings. Um, for instance, one, one point we found quite interesting is the placement of the prayer mat over grains, bags of grain. Um, and in the morning at 5 o'clock, people would pray. They wouldn't necessarily go to the mosque. And that because this is where the prayer mats were located, rats might have urinated, that this might be a key point in which people are getting their face down into uh, a point of transmission. and you know, where this is the kind of like key um, material point of, of, of contact. Um, and finally, looking at kind of the tempo of infection, you know, where cooking takes place, um, when, you know, during the rainy season, people might leave for the fields and houses are closed up more often, more, more often and that that kind of darkness and lack of disturbance might also be a key point in which um, rats are finding um, habitable inside the home. So this is, can't see very well, but this is an image of a, of a burrow um, that's kind of right in the corner of a bed. And just to kind of remind us of the intimacy of the disease transmission, kind of anchored in these spaces of cohabitation, material culture, um, and one point, nice point that Catherine made about kind of this sense of home, you know, where, where we're living um, and, you know, what kinds of things will we tolerate or not. And, Number of the residents that we spoke to would talk about the times when, you know, at what level would they turn, try to scare away rats? It wasn't when they were hearing them. They said, you know, we'd hear the babies making their noise, but if the rats came to lick their fingers, it might be a moment where they turn on the light. So, again, these kind of thresholds at which, you know, you're habituated to animals living in your house, and at what point does, does that become a kind of conflict around conviviality? And, 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 and aside this too is how people take what kinds of measures they'll take. Where you know if they'll use poisons, where will they use poisons? What's the kind of point at which you know poisons will be laid within the house? Um, and again, just trying to get a kind of deeper sense of this kind of tactile and embodied experience of domestic space to produce finer grain insights about where contact is happening um, and where where you might be able to to intervene. So. The other kind of set of work that we're looking at is um, around bushmeat. Um, and again, this kind of effort to situate and give greater ethnographic depth to why and how people um, are <coughs> eating animals. And in this case, we're talking about rats. And we were particularly interested about kind of who was doing the trapping and why they were doing the trapping. And you know, when you talk about bushmeat, there is that iconic image of the kind of hunter with a gun out in you know the deep forest shooting an animal, bringing it back. But what we're interested in this much more kind of domestic set of interactions around animals, um, children playing um, with the rats, um, 
for instance, kind of a series of these incredible um, traps. This is a Torley with the mobile phone there that comes and kind of nooses um, the rat, and both for eating, but also trying to, um, as, for, as pest control at the beginning of the season, trying to get rid of rats. So, I mean, this kind of much more complicated set of when, you know, when or why you might be eating, um, eating these animals. Also discovered this kind of distinction people were drawing between town rats versus bush rats. Um, town rats, they felt, were diseased because there had been a number of lasso fever campaigns, and town rats were seen as dirty, closer to human habitation, um, and um, yeah, trains and, and, and other, and that they were the site of disease, so no one was eating them, and that the bush rat was fine. Unfortunately, that's exactly opposite of the case, and the species that were carrying lasso fever were the ones that people were eating and the ones they were avoiding were less dangerous. So again, some key questions about where this public um, health messaging is taking place and how it relates with you know, people's models or understanding of what's dirty, what's clean, what's, um, you know, what people can eat or not. So this brings us to the outbreak. Um, and my master student, Jesse, was um, doing this work about kind of perceptions about um, what people, what, um, what kinds of rats people felt happy about eating. And the outbreak um, began, and this is a picture from his mobile phone about um, you know, how to prevent Ebola. And it says, prevent Ebola, avoid eating wild animals, especially monkeys, chimpanzees, and bats. Um, which, <laughs> there's a number of kind of points to elaborate here. I mean, one is being that I think it's, there's a wide consensus that it's one transmission, a spillover event, and that the key kind of point to boiling Ebola is actually human to human. So there's this kind of leveling of risk, which says, you know, bushmeat is the key problem. Everyone stop eating bushmeat. And, you know, also languages problems, like, you know, what can people can read or understand. Um, you know, what are the, a number of big questions, Mark, about what we were saying earlier about what actually is the reservoir and what kind of dangerous practice there are. But this kind of comes out um, as this is the kind of key public health message. And the kind of very, I think, troubling kind of knock-on effects of that wide messaging is that people really um, responded that this was, you know, as this was a clear example of that this was a conspiracy, right? Because these are everyday practices. People have been eating these animals and not been getting sick. Why is it all of a sudden that, that this one event has occurred? And there was a number of rumors about that this was a, a plot between the conservationists who want to get us out of these, um, you know, out of these forested areas, and the government, which is highly fractured in Guinea along ethnic lines, and that this was an obvious attempt to, you know, either kill um, or you know, do harm to these particular communities. And it didn't, um, it didn't sit very well. So during the outbreak, the project kind of moved from Lhasa fever, um, got swept much more into questions about um, bat um, ecology. And working with ecologists at the Robert Koch Institute, we began to try to look at from some of the points Kevin was raising about these kind of human-animal um, interactions, where people were coming into contact with bats, focusing on the sites of contact, who was eating bats, and why. Um, and again, I think there's a lot of conventional wisdom that deforestation or kind of um, practices, local practices, are, that are that are not um, informed by conservation are causing this interface, and that may be the case. But in a lot of these villages in Guinea, they're not. You know, in kind of deforested areas, but they're actually um, surrounded by dense vegetation, and where their farms are on a kind of different area, which might um, be a very good site for um, you know crop raiding bats. So there's we're trying to look at you know what were the you know policies and practices of land use, what kinds of species of bats are coming into contact there. Um, also looking at a key couple border crossing areas. Um, Kalema Gavena, which is a, um, a Guinean isthmus where a community of Sierra Leonean refugees was based and where there's also a large number of bats. And looking at that map too, thinking about kind of human and bat mi migration as, um, as you know, intimately involved. Um, also a number of caves, um, the Ziyama Forest on the border of Guinea and Liberia, um, which 
is another place where Ghanaian hunters were going to um, find that. So again, kind of the hope here is, and this is kind of ongoing work, is to look closely at these, um, at this interface between, you know, where there might be, you always have this, you know, a common reservoir, why people might be eating bats, how it fits into local value chains on trade, and, you know, what might be a good set of interventions um, that could potentially help prevent a threat outbreak. So again, just to summarize, um, our current work seeks to add this kind of ethnographic depth to the consumption of bush meat by exploring value chain um, in the kind of trade of meats, um, looking at the material culture of hunting and handling and trapping um, bush meat, the intersections of human animal migration, um, and kind of local ideas of classification and kind of symbolism. And what does it mean? Who's, who's actually doing the hunting, what kinds of obligations you might have to share the meat or not, what's the kind of different everyday moments in which um, animals are killed. Also kind of who is doing this in terms of the gendered or generational aspects of hunting and you know, trying to open up that category a bit because we have such, a, we have such an iconic idea of what you know, this, this one hunter looks like. But again, kind of see it as a much more average, I mean, kind of everyday set of practices. Um, we're also interested in this kind of political resonance of the bans. What, you know, what does a kind of bush meat ban mean to these people? How do they read it in terms of kind of the politics of access to resources? You know, who, who are the institutions instituting the bans and what does that do to the kind of credibility or the meaning of this message? Um, and how, you know, if you're going to create new kind of ways of intervening in that kind of spillover, what does that public health messaging have to look like? Um, and this is a point that both Catherine and Bonnie have made quite strongly, and that's so important, is taking rumors seriously. How to, how to listen to people's rumors, not just as the kind of uninformed um, or misinformed or kind of um, uneducated utterances of, of publics that don't understand what the real dynamics are, but as situated sets of concerns, as anxieties that really reflect a long-term engagement with medical research or with, with governments um, in power, and that you know, there's, there, is, there is a logic um, to those sets of conspiracies and rumors. Okay, so the time I've left, I'm just gonna briefly talk a bit about this anthropology um, response platform. It's in the UK. This essentially is organized, um, and has been just funded by the Department of um, International Development to create a kind of synergy um, site around um, anthropologists working in a number of different fields um, to interface with government. And the hope is to provide this clear, practical, real-time advice about how best to understand sociocultural and political dimensions of the virus and build locally appropriate interventions, which sounds great. And in some ways, there is a kind of oxymoron or contradiction to the kind of rapid-paced anthropology and the kind of immersive, long-term, um, deeply rooted methodologies that, you know, produces the insights that we have to offer. So it's been this very careful balance between, you know, producing some interesting, you know, important interventions and also not reifying, saying, you know, well, the men do do this, therefore everyone stop doing why. And I think that's that's been a, a learning process, but it's been very heartening, at least Think of the UK, how engaged and how willing some of the government has been to listen to anthropologists. I think precisely because of what Bonnie said about this, when there's nothing left to do and the, they said the cupboard's empty, you know, anthropologists, you know, come on in and give us some ideas or there seems to be some dirty practices involved here, some bush meat, some exotic burial issues, you know, let's bring in anthropologists. So I, it's been this kind of ambiguous but exciting possibility um, to create, you know, to attend some of these meetings, to speak to um, policymakers and public health professionals about how to think about um, these interventions. And it's an online research portal um, we've been trying to develop. And this is also dovetailed with really significant and powerful work in the America um, with this kind of Ebola initiative and also in France and in Europe, also to kind of bring together um, networks of who's working in country, trying to identify programs that are getting rolled out, and to, to, to have some kind of interface and iterative site of advice. So that's our um, website. I'll just briefly speak a little bit about what we 
been doing. Um, the first is identifying diagnosing cases. And I think one, um, and when Halbert was talking a bit about this, is this how to bring down the r not. And one key initiative from the UK is to set up these Ebola care units, which are supposed to be closer to the community and so that people will present earlier. And then you don't have a week that they're infected and they show up at treatment centers, which are overrun. But if you have these kind of small intermediary steps near the community, you might be able to catch them faster um, and then you know, be able to treat them. Now, there's a number of questions about how to do this safely, um, how best to put up these, these units, what, how are they going to be stocked, what kind of services they're going to provide. Because as you see, people are interested in quality care. And if these sites are not going to be places where people will get quality care, why would you go to them? But again, I think there, there is something um, quite valuable in the initiative to bring things closer to the community, to get community buy-in, to actually tap into what other kinds of local strategies might already be in place in order to not necessarily kind of you know, throw your hands up and say enough with the Ebola treatment centers, but to decentralize um, the approach and to kind of rescale these large um, public health initiatives to um, local sites. Other key set of um, briefs and concerns is around the management of the dead. Um, and you know, a number of this work has taken great inspiration from Hewlett's and from Alain Apobois about how to, you know, how to how to create dignified burials, right? And if this issue is I would rather die than suffer this kind of social death, is how do you create an, a space where you can mourn and have a set of practices that might be close enough to a kind of communal social response, but also balance the needs of biosafety. And some of those points might be as simple as allowing a transparent body bag so people can see their relatives, knowing where these graves are, um, allowing some kind of music to be played. I know it's been another key point, but how to make this a site of mourning. Um, and Matthias, our colleague who's currently in Monrovia, said that you know one of the things he finds quite anxious is these mass cremations because he says you know we've learned a lot of lessons from the past, but you know that some of those lessons are being forgotten, and that whether people are so terrified of these mass cremations that they're actually not turning up um, to treatment centers. Another um, site we're looking at for caring for the sick, um, and again looking at the kind of gender-based nature of care um, and the material culture of care. Um, wherever before. Using gloves is, can be highly problematic because people see, again, the intimacy of care and touch that if you put on something like a barrier, it suggests that you're trying to, to create distance between yourself and the patient. But how to you know, re, um, you know, reinforce and kind of re-socialize some of those, those practices. And finally, um, clinical trials. Uh, this is the, the working group that I'm coordinating with Claire Chandler. Um, and there's been a number of really interesting and you know, exciting developments, um, source of a lot of hope about new biomedical pathways, new treatments, new vaccines that might really be able to make a dent. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of kind of considered questions about how best to run these trials. How are they going to be feasible? Um, it's MSF is involved um, in running most of these and are very emphatic that, you know, the classic kind of RCT placebo control trial might cause a problem, and how to think about different adaptive designs that might pr be able to generate some good evidence, but don't raise the same kind of set of anxieties um, and concerns that kind of giving a placebo or um, you know, randomizing um, across the community might um, trigger. Um, so we're we're trying to work with um, investigators thinking about what would how we think about compensation, how we think about the kind of target populations of these trials in terms of um, you know, whether these are sick people, whether they're um, frontline health workers, who you would vaccinate, um, and what this category of the survivor means. There's a number of projects around collecting survivors' blood and plasma um, and how this population, um, you know, what, what kind of population is this? What do we mean by survivor? Are there people who've just come in contact with the disease? Who are, you know, what kind of vulnerabilities do they face? I mean, a number of these people have like not only survived the virus, but have also had um, their belongings burnt, might be in a situation of incredible um, economic vulnerability, and how this kind of research can take into account those contexts in doing that kind of work. So just to 
round up. Again, I think what's you know important to bear in mind and to think about with these new biomedical um, interventions is that you know this is this is incredibly exciting and there's a lot of potential um, for these treatments and people are you know invested a lot. They, there's a lot of hope that you know treatments coming soon. But how to make sure that these this kind of research and these trials don't detract um, from public health um, capacities, right? To to building up these infrastructures, and they they don't have to. I mean, these trials come with an enormous amount of resources, training, um, and I think thinking more about how to integrate this kind of research in longer term um, interventions into the region is a is a critical question. Um, this brings us back to saying a bit about how different disease problems, you know, something like Ebola, which is so terrifying, and this is kind of punctuated outbreak, can generate different sets of resources than something that's endemic. And, you know, it's, it's getting around again to high season for Lassa fever, um, and this might, you know, I mean, Lassa fever is one, malaria, obstructed labor, a whole set of other public health problems, which are, you know, might be in addition to the tragedy of Ebola, the real horrific tragedy of what this outbreak is going to bring. Um, so again, you know, the, never to undercut the importance of doing research on kind of, you know, on emerging um, diseases, which are incredibly catastrophic, but also, and I think this is one of the advantages of this workshop and um, this kind of interdisciplinary panel is to think about kind of the situated set of problems, right? And to, to see that emerging disease also scans quite, <laughs> quickly into threats for biosecurity threats for you know the West um, and more able governments. And you know, what's the difference between a kind of threat, kind of a public health threat um, that you have to catch at the borders, and these kind of you know a deep public health risks and problems that these communities face um, for you know on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think I'm gonna end there. Thank you.